Well, good afternoon, and thanks for coming out to today's informational program on safety in Falls Church City Schools. I'm Bill Wanland. My wife, Martha Netherton, and I, and I are co-chairs of the Local Affairs Committee of the Falls Church League of Women Voters. Welcome, fellow League members. Uh, for those of you who aren't members but would like to join or just want to know more, there's some information about programs and membership uh, here by the door. Uh, the League is co-sponsoring this program along with the Falls Church City Public Schools and the City of Falls Church, whose participation today is an indication of the importance that our officials place on this topic. I think we all recognize that no community or school is immune from a tragedy. And the complexity of the problem is suggested by the people you're about to hear from today. And not just school administrators, but police, fire and rescue services, and of course, students. And because in a very short time, renovation will start on our city's high school, we've also invited representative of the firm responsible for developing the project to share with you his firm's plans for building a safe and welcoming educational environment. The League of Women Voters of Falls Church is committed to helping keep the public informed on key local issues, and we can think of really no issue more important than the safety of our daughters and sons. And we're also committed to a, an open exchange of ideas. Uh, the information has to flow both ways, though. Our panelists today need to hear your concerns as well. So the final portion of our program is reserved for audience questions and comments from parents and non-parents alike. So please plan on raising the issues that you believe need fuller explanation or clarification. Uh, today's discussion will revolve largely around the new high school because that's where much of the city's attention and resources are focused. Uh, but we know that many of you are parents of kids from the lower schools who aren't at George Mason yet. If you have questions pertaining to conditions at Thackeray or Mount Daniel or TJ, or here at Henderson or at St. James, please don't hold back. Uh, our discussants want to hear from you as well. And I can't end without acknowledging the enormous contribution of City Council Member and Vice Mayor Mary Beth Connolly, who's also the Community Outreach Director of Falls Church City Public Schools. The League, and Martha and I in particular, owe her a great debt of gratitude for all she did to make this afternoon's program come together. Thanks, Mary Beth. Now let's start the conversation. It's my pleasure to present Dr. Peter Noonan, the superintendent of Falls Church Public Schools, and our police chief, Mary Gavin, who will give an overview of today's school safety situation. All right, thank you, Bill. Dr. Noonan. Thank you. Thank you, Bill and Martha, and uh, there you are, and uh, league members for being here, um, and community members for being here as well. It's a, a true pleasure to be able to have this opportunity uh, to speak a little bit about um, school safety, something that is, of course, paramount um, to uh, our, um, our work and what we do in our schools. So um, to give you a brief overview of sort of how we're hoping that the day will flow, and, and I think that um, Bill framed it very nicely, is that the first part of um, this presentation is going to be uh, about 30 minute, maybe less than that, actually, overview from myself and uh, Chief Gavin to talk about uh, kind of where we currently are um, and then the second movement if you will of the presentation will be a panel uh, and we've got some really great panelists that are here and uh, I'll ask some questions of them and sort of help facilitate the panel along and then the last portion is reserved for any questions and answers from uh, those of you that are in the audience so um, before we get started I do want to thank um, our board members that are here um, this afternoon we have Lawrence Webb who's our school board chair thank you for coming out uh, Greg Anderson is here and Shannon Litton is here uh, and I also want to extend my thanks to Mary Beth Connolly for, um, for her help on the school side and also on the city side uh, for pulling us all together. Um, so let me, let me go ahead and get started. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the presentation and then I'm going to ask Chief Gavin to come up and talk a little bit more about um, some of the things that they're doing uh, as, with respect to uh, the presentation I'm going to share. I have way more slides than I anticipated I was going to have, and so I will work through them just as quickly as I can because I don't want to um, create uh, any any opportunity any barrier to us having a conversation. But the first thing you'll notice is that this says June 18th, 2018, um, and the reason that I uh, have that date up there 
is because we last spring in the schools did three presentations at work sessions sort of back to back. We started in April, we had another work session in May, and we had a third work session in June. And at each of those three public work sessions, and they're online, so if you want to go back and look at them and get more detail, you're certainly welcome to do that. But in each of those work sessions, we took school safety and we tried to sort of peel it apart, if you will. And so at the first work session in April, we did an overview of kind of where are we uh, with respect to our current practices here in the City of Falls Church schools. The second was what are some of the national best practices that are out there with respect to schools? And then the third one was, how do we now compare what our current practices are, what are the best practices that are out there, and how do we close the gap? And what are some things that we need to work on specifically that will help us uh, do a better job in the City of Falls Church ensuring that our students are, uh, are safe? So, um, so, so the first part of this presentation is really um, going to be an overview of all of the schools and sort of our school safety in general and then the second part we'll get a little bit more into the high school design uh, and then certainly with Q&A. So let me start um, just by sharing a couple of slides right at the beginning. This comes from the first um, work session that we had that sort of talks about what are the current practices that we have in place that are available uh, to help support safety in our schools. And starting with the exterior, just so everyone's aware, we do have security cameras throughout um, all of our campuses that uh, we are able to monitor um, both centrally uh, and, and um, also in the case of a crisis emergency event or a crisis event, those cameras can also be taken over, if you will, by the police department. So we can turn them, turn them over since they are web-based so that anybody in the police department who needs to see them can. Uh, of course, we have alarm systems. Um, we have limited door entries at many of our schools, and I, I will share with you um, one of the really exciting uh, possibilities about the new high school is that we are significantly limiting access to the building. Right now, I think there are 94 doors, uh, and we will have one entry point that is common that will funnel all of our kids through. We'll have lots of egress points, but uh, you won't be able to come in those doors. But limited access that is monitored by a security staff. In all five of our schools, and I include Thackeray as well, uh, we do uh, hire a company called Securitas um, in each of those schools to come in and, and support um, the access control. Uh, we have access control prox readers, um, which are the badges, and the badges you swipe in and you swipe out. Uh, you can't get in if you, if you just walk up to the door. Um, you have to be buzzed in by the security person uh, unless you have a prox reader as well. Uh, we have good exterior lighting to maintain the outsides as well. On the inside, um, we have our entrances that again are monitored. We have security staff that monitor the inside of the buildings and also we have some at the high school and at the middle school in particular. Um, and at TJ, uh, we have uh, the exterior of the building monitored as well by Securitas staff. Um, we have security cameras again, visitor screening, uh, which is a new system that we put in a year and a half, two years ago where anyone who comes in has to put their driver's license through the system and then they get a badge and they won't get a security badge and they won't get a security badge if they don't pass the screening uh, as part of the process. Um, all of our classroom doors lock, um, some from the outside, some or all of them lock from the inside but some of the doors swing open uh, towards the hallway which is a, a barrier for us for safety at the high school particularly and that's another uh, example of something we're excited about being able to change in the new building, but most of our, many of our doors also um, come inward. Uh, and then we have the capacity to cover all of our door windows um, if there is a need to do that, so if we have to shelter in place. That's the physical side um, of security. Um, with respect to communications, some of the ways that we communicate are, you know, we have a school resource officer that's assigned to George Mason and Mary Ellen Henderson, so some of you might know Clark Gagnon. Uh, Clark is our school resource officer who we all know, uh, we work with on a day in and day out basis, works very closely with Mr. Hills and also with Valerie Hardy here at the middle school and if there is an issue that comes up at the elementary, he also is, is open to um, going there. We have ongoing training with our first responders, um, we'll share more about that uh, as we move forward. Uh, we often will hold after action meetings if there is a circumstance that's come up. 
uh, regular meetings with our public safety command and school administrators. And um, that is a, a meeting that we have um, semi-annually, actually. We do it more than, uh, more than once a year. Internally, we have public address systems throughout the building. Ongoing emergency drills are part of our process, and they are required by the state. Uh, as well, so we have to document those and then submit them, and those are for any crisis that you can, not any crisis, but many of the crises, crises that you can imagine. We do tornado drills, we do earthquake drills, we do safety drills, uh, shelter in place, lockdowns, and the like. Uh, and then we have a division-wide radio uh, network as well. So um, you'll see many of our folks in Seve Padilla, our director of facilities, is here today. And I'm surprised he doesn't have his radio. Usually he does. Uh, but we can communicate across the division with these radios as well. Um, so we are always, always working on that. So then we got to the second, and I'm, again, I'm going to kind of work through these quickly. Um, the second work session, which was in May, and we talked about those best practices that are out there. And, and when we pulled the Virginia Department of Education's best practices on safety and school security, there were five areas that they really designated and identified that we really need to pay very close attention to. Uh, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. So as we went through each of those, um, what, what we did was we identified um, for example, under prevention, which are actions taken to prevent emergency incidences, uh, how are we doing? And so we put, where you see these green pluses are areas that we think we do a really nice job with here in the city of Falls Church. And the yellow are some areas that we need to improve upon, which became then our work plans uh, for the school division. And I'll share those sort of at the end of the presentation, which is day, which was the third presentation that we did for the school board. So with respect to intervention, um, we feel like we have a really great threat assessment team. Um, we have school social workers, school psychologists, school counselors. If there is a threat that comes to us, we're able to move through that very quickly um, through our threat assessment process. We have close communication with our police and emergency responders. And I think that that's evidenced by not only our school resource officer, but the fact that Mary Gavin and I, Chief Gavin and I, um, speak on a regular basis, as well as Tom Polera, uh, who will be on our panel this afternoon. Um, we are working to uh, get better with, if you see something, say something, uh, because we know that our kids are our best assets in our schools when it comes to identifying if there's, a, if there's the potential for a critical incident. And we actually have had a number of occasions where students have come to us and identified someone that was in crisis, that needed an extra touch, if you will, and so that's where our threat assessment came in. So we would call that student in, call that student in and that it's clear enough to all of our students to, if you, if you hear something or if you see something, to say something, and how do you do that? And then empowering school staff. Um, you know, how do we embrace uh, the diversity of our school programming, positive daily interactions with at-risk students, eliminating cultural stigmas and tolerances and prejudices? We do a nice job with this, but we can always, um, we can always do better. And how are we talking with students to dissuade them from a dangerous path? And how do, we, how do we connect with those students and build relationships to be able to do that? Also under prevention, um, we really felt like we needed to establish a focus group to really think about how do we, how do we approach bullying. Um, we don't have any issues, significant issues in our, in our city right now with gang violence, but uh, we need to pay attention to it. And then, it, and then any kind of radicalization or extremism, um, uh, that we need to, to get our head, head and, and heart around, um, but more than anything, really looking at this bullying piece. And so we've started some focus group areas around that because that was a yellow for us. We didn't have a standing um, meeting, if you will, to really look at that. Uh, we do a nice job with after school activities, and I think we do a really nice job of um, utilizing the planning resources for the, from the Virginia Center for school and campus safety. Those are some nice resources that are out there that talk about training stakeholders, developing information, reviewing it, facilitating annual um, audits in the building, and then developing partnerships between state and local jurisdictions. The next uh, is protection, um, and this is really about hardening infrastructure, so it's a yellow for us. Are there some things that we can do better? Absolutely. And so some of the things that we, we knew immediately was at George Mason High School, there were some doors that you could walk along that were ostensibly locked, but if you pulled hard enough, you could actually open them. So we uh, went back and reviewed all of those doors, and I think we ended up spending several thousand dollars um, to make sure that all of the locking hardware worked. Um, there are some other infrastructure hardening things that we could look at as well. 
um, that we are uh, looking at purchasing um, in the future, which would be um, some, some interior locking devices. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at some of those things, uh, maintaining our security systems, our fire and burglary alarm, uh, and, and emergency panic buttons. And we're actually pretty good at that, but I think where we need to pay attention is our windows and door security, particularly at the high school, and making sure that we update and upgrade our camera and access controls as necessary. So technology is changing all the time, right? And so um, the fact that we need to have web-based uh, camera systems is really important so that we can turn those over. Our security staff, we're a plus. Um, again, we do annual emergency trainings. We've got a great security staff at our locations uh, and great coordination with our police department. Under mitigation, um, some of the things that we looked at is, uh, again, the, the threat assessment was a positive for us. Um, our police and school-based teams, um, this is something that we want to continue to work on. And how do we get better at um, police intervention, um, not necessarily based on the, the um, threat assessment and the like, um, and again, providing training to us. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we move ahead too. Under response, the areas um, that were of yellow, uh, communication with parents and students. We, we needed to go back and look at how do we communicate crisis information quickly? Is it best to use text, phone, email, um, et cetera? And so we have uh, looked at school messenger and some other items, and I'll talk more about those in a second. Um, and then multiple methods of response. And this is where we get into thinking about not just lockdown, but how do we engage in alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate as necessary. And that is the ALICE training that we're currently going through right now. And uh, Tom Palera, who is our emergency manager, a management person in the city, has done a really tremendous job with um, his staff helping us uh, get trained around that. And then under recovery, um, you know, continuity of operations, we do have a, what's called a COOP plan uh, in action. Uh, and so we, we have a member on the team to make sure that we continue to, uh, in a crisis, be able to continue our operations appropriately. We do an annual review with our insurance carriers. Um, but crisis team activation and response is something that we wanted to go back and take a look at. How do we um, garner the resources of school social workers, school psychologists, um, school counselors and the like if there is indeed a crisis uh, that we, we need to deal with and how do we pull a team together and so now we're working on developing sort of action teams or crisis teams that are helping us with that. And then in action, uh, physical security, um, we have secure vestibules um, in a couple of our buildings but in the new building that we'll share today we'll have an absolutely secure vestibule um, so it will be hard to get in without um, being buzzed in. Uh, and then an area of focus for us are these emergency events, um, centralized automatic lockdowns, um, emergency egress points, and the like. Some of the references in the reference list, and you all will have access to this presentation. This is up on our website now uh, because we shared this in April, May, and June of last year. But I'll, I'll put it up again um, so that you can also look at it. But there are a number of resources that we um, have utilized uh, to include the uh, Virginia Department of Ed, uh, the FBI, uh, and their Office of Partner Engagement, and then the U.S. Department of Education as well, to name a few. And then the third session that we had um, specifically was recommendations for closing the gap. So those areas that were yellow, we pulled those now out and said, okay, what are we going to do about them? And how are we going to work through those appropriately to really support and strengthen our safety, school safety program here in the city of Falls Church. And so um, we started with hardening of infrastructure. And so we um, are evaluating our options right now in terms of adding additional hardening potential. So we're looking at vestibule security at each of the schools. So for example, um, if you were to go to George Mason High School today, there is a vestibule, or there isn't a vestibule that you have to go through to get in. There's a door, you have to be buzzed in or you can swipe in, but once you're in the building, you're in the building. That front desk is staffed by a security person the entire day, um, but a better solution, and you'll see in our, our new design, is to have sort of an enclosed vestibule, much like if you've been to Jesse Thackeray, or even here at, um, at the middle school, you walk in a set of doors and you can't get in that next set of doors unless you're buzzed into that next set of doors. So if you're someone who's coming in to do harm, you wanna have multiple um, steps for that person to get through. So looking at each of those, 
Um, reviewing, um, we did have the Transportation Security Administration come out and do a safety audit for us. That actually is, has been received and we were taking action around that and specifically it was our school bus safety because you know we have multiple layers of safety that we have to look at. It's not just during the school day, it's after school, it's bus safety uh, and the like. And then annually assessing our security measures and looking at points of entry, our camera systems, security staffing and the like. And that's under hardening. Under un empowering teachers to respond in an emergency, um, thinking about our current practice which is shelter in place and um, uh, Mr. Polera is going to talk a little bit about that, um, maybe not being the best approach um, and what happens if you do shelter in place and there is uh, an active incident. Um, so rather than sheltering in place, if you can get out and evacuate, it's a better solution. Um, so it's about good communication and understanding what your options are. So looking at ALICE training for all of our staff um, and again working in uh, combination and collaboration with our police department as well. The next is see something, say something, um, and right now it varies by school and it's quite informal, so we are designing and implementing a new say something, uh, see something, say something campaign. Um, we are working on a student tip line, we're branding that tip line to include posters and advertisements, uh, exploring vendors currently, and we are, right now we work with Crisis Link, um, but there are some components of Crisis Link um, that can also be more useful to us that, that would include also a suicide prevention text line, which is also another crisis that we deal with in our, our schools as well, is the emotional health and wellness of our students. Um, immediate communications, um, right now we use email, Twitter, school messenger, um, but we want to enhance our mass notification systems, and so school messenger is a really great system that we have uh, that actually can drill down um, better than other systems. So we have in the past used, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, not Survey Monkey, but it's the other. We, we've been using another system. We, we really want it. Hmm? Mailchimp. Mailchimp. Yeah, Survey Monkey Mailchimp. I knew it had something to do with a <laughs> primate in there. Um, but we, we can do better than, than Mailchimp. And so School Messenger allows us to really get information out more quickly. Um, and we can expedite that for students, staff, parents, and the community. And we're working to refine those, those practices as well. Um, close partnerships with our public safety um, folks, and, and here again today you'll see them, um, but you know, preventative and systematic training, increasing our dialogue, making sure that we're continually talking. Um, looking at diversity, bullying, and digital citizenship, and here we're talking about a comprehensive multi-tiered systems of support, which is MTSS framework, so that we're looking at the social and emotional aspects of students as well, because if we have great relationships with kids, and we're better able to understand where those students are socially and emotionally, oftentimes we get into a preventative mode with students, um, which is very, very helpful. So looking at that comprehensive um, social emotional piece uh, for implementation is important. Um, establishing focus groups for safety, security, and bullying, as I mentioned before. Um, another best practice is um, to evaluate um, knowable information that might indicate that there's a risk. So again, um, looking at uh, our social workers, looking at prevention and intervention across grade levels, and again, building those relationships with students is really important. Um, establishing action steps to restore um, a learning environment post an event. Right now, um, we have a safety school system safety uh, committee, but um, it's very informal, so really looking at how do we enhance that on a more routine basis and proactively plan uh, with public safety and others. And so in summary, um, again, there are a couple of resources here. Um, the Secret Service, the U.S. Department of Education was informative to us. The Virginia Department of Criminal Justice also was informative. But these are the areas that we really feel like um, helped us align those areas that we need to be better in. Um, and so we are spending a lot of time focusing on that. Now, I've, I've had an opportunity to work, in, and this is where I, I feel very um, good about having an opportunity to have worked in a number of school districts across the country, across the world. Um, and I will tell you, when I came to Falls Church and saw that we have school safety and security, that we have that are, are on staff at each one of our schools, that we have um, interior and exterior cameras, that we only have 2,600 students division wide across five schools, so that allows us to understand who our kids are and really build relationships. 
and really strong um, staffing around our school social workers, our school psychologists, our school counselors. Um, we are positioned very well in this city to one, know our students and really think about how do we um, deal with kids on an ongoing basis to interrupt um, action if there is a concern that a student has before it becomes an issue. Um, and then also the hardening factors um, of the school in particular um, that are gonna be part of the new design of the high school will, will be equally exciting. So let me, um, let me skip to that real quick um, and then I'll go back to those pictures in just a second. Uh, we did show a slide at the Sunday series a couple of weeks ago um, that was called School Safety and Security. And this is the um, current floor plan or design for the front of the, uh, for the first floor of the new high school. So these doors here are, are coming off of this plaza, right? So students would walk in and this blue area is that secured vestibule that I was mentioning before. So there'll be a safety and security officer stationed in this secured vestibule and students and parents um, will not be able to get through these doors unless, um, except and unless those doors are opened by school safety and school staff. So these, there is another set of doors here. So when school starts, students will be able to walk through those doors. But after um, the start of school, anyone who comes into this secured vestibule will be directed through this door here, which goes into the main office. In the main office, they'll have to check in, and then there's this door here where, the, where they will come out. So you kind of come in, you take a left, you take a right, and then you're able to access the rest of the school. Um, so that's one thing about um, the school safety that's really important. The second is that the, that school safety officer is gonna be through there, they'll be routed through. Um, we'll have a central school resource officer office somewhere in this area, we think, right now. Um, which would probably have uh, or potentially have eyes on the hallway as well, um, which I think will be great. Um, but that school resource officer, again, is part of the administrative team um, that sits here. The other thing that I want to make sure that everybody understands is that this is a five-story above grade building. And this is the first floor. And on this first floor, we, have, we certainly have the cafeteria, we have the administrative offices, and we have the auditorium. This auditorium is empty about 90% of the time. So there isn't a lot that's happening in this area most of the days. Um, there is this cafeteria that's used all the time, but instruction and academic core areas don't begin until you get to the third floor. Um, so this is the first floor. So you actually have to go up two more floors before you get to the majority of what's happening um, in the school. Um, at, or you can go down. And down the stairs is um, where art, uh, the art, uh, performing arts are, and physical education. These, this central staircase here is called, the, we're calling it the spine of the school. So if you think about it being a five-story building, it's got a single spine that goes up, up the school. Um, and this can be um, secured remotely and, or um, right when you get there. So if there is a critical incident, let's say on this main level, these doors can be locked down and that person or that incident is then limited only to this floor. They can't go down, they can't go up. And that happens at all of the floors on this central staircase. And I think that that's, that's important to note. Um, the other is that in the, a circumstance where we're in a lockdown and a shelter in place for some sort of critical incident, um, all of the classrooms will have blinds so that they can be um, blocked off so that you can't see in, you can't see out. Um, there's been a lot of conversation around uh, the amount of glass that's going in this building and whether or not it can be secured. And I, I, want, I brought these pictures because I think that um, there may be a misunderstanding about how much glass is going in the building. Um, so I asked the architects to send us a couple of renderings of what it might look like uh, in the classrooms. And so I just wanted to share with you that this is the amount of glass that we're talking about. Um, it's not, these are not full glass walls. Um, at, at a school that we did visit, there were some full glass walls, but we're not talking about full glass walls here. We're talking about a couple of windows. These will have shades that can close, um, but the exterior windows will be full, full so um, you'll be able to, to see out, and so it'll be good light. Um, there are some classrooms that are being designed with um, taller windows, 
But again, the important part of this is that there will be blinds, you can't see in, can't see out, and there is an area if you needed to lock down and get behind a wall, you could. And that was, that was another piece that was really important to us. But I think some people have been picturing in their minds um, full glass, full length walls um, uh, of glass. So um, I, I think I went over time and I, and I really apologize. Um, so I'm gonna turn over to, uh, to our chief here and, and we'll stay as long as you want us to stay. So, um, but I do wanna turn it over, so there you go. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for coordinating this, Mary Beth and, and the League of Women Voters. Um, um, I, um, I just want to give an overview of some of the principles. So what does it mean to have a school resource officer and what does it mean to have police in the schools? Um, because that's been going on for many, many years. Um, prior to my assignment here in Falls Church, I was a school resource officer in Arlington County for many years. And after I left that position, they put me back into that position as the supervisor over 18 school resource officers. So I have a wealth of knowledge in terms of how the police work through schools and how um, it works and sometimes how, sometimes how it doesn't. But um, I want to steal a line from our school resource officer who isn't here today. And I actually made him stay home because he's got a special um, anniversary with his uh, family. Uh, but he wanted to be here. But he said to me as I, we, we made the approach to this, he said, school safety starts at home. And that's very, very true. I mean, particularly these days with the kids and the number of pressures that they're under, it really is incumbent upon parents to actually get the temperature of how their kid is leaving the house and what's going on with that kid or if they hear stories that they, they make the counselors aware. And, I, and we do have a very robust um, relationship and ability to communicate. And as parents, it's incumbent upon us when our kids are in a difficult place is to know why and ask them and have those conversations. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have Clark. I think Clark is embedded in these schools and uh, really enjoys this job. And most importantly, he enjoys kids. And that's probably one of the key things with school resource officers to ensure that they enjoy kids. And I know Clark is part of that. Um, one of the main principles about schools and police are police are here to help facilitate a safe environment. And in doing so, they are part of the school administration, but they're also a part of ensuring that any crimes that occur in the school are taken care of. And they're like a sheriff within its own community. And I will dare say an SRO is probably one of the only police officers that is comfortable in a school. Because when you take a patrol officer in and put him in the high school, they feel a little strange mainly because the kids think it's strange and they always ask the SRO, who called the cops? Like the SRO isn't one. But I can tell you, um, the SROs are embedded in the schools. They understand that it's sacred ground. And anything that occurs in that schools, they work with the administration, they work with the detectives sometimes, and they work with the Commonwealth attorneys to seek the best solution for maybe a family or a kid in crisis. The other thing that happens that I want you to understand is when there is a crime in the community, we don't bring it into the schools. You know, that's a big no-no. Unless a kid comes with some types of threat to the school that's based on a crime outside in the community. And we would alert the administration, um, for instance. Um, there were times when I was a school resource officer back in the day when we had gang issues. And we knew that there was a threat outside the school on the street during you know, a weekend event and we thought that they might have an incident in the school later. And so we would stand up some type of protective measures. We would do the same in this school. If we felt like somebody brought something into the school from a crime into the school, we would take action. But typically, if there is something that happens outside the schools with a juvenile, let's say it's a party and, and a couple were fighting or something like that, we would not bring that back into the school. Um, so that's really important to know because sometimes the schools get burdened with a lot of information from the community and a lot of expectations from the community that has nothing to do with the schools. And we want to make sure that's pretty pure uh, because it can get kind of confusing. Um, school safety really is based on people, training, and environment. And environment, I talk about technology. People, it, it really is about the parents and the kids starting at home, understanding where we are. 
The people also that are so important to this, the first responders in the school are the teachers and the workers in the school. They are the first responders. Um, training. Training is very important. And we have evolved through the time since my, I've been here in the city for about 11 years. And our training has evolved in large part because of Tom Polera. And he has studied and researched all of the methods of operation of threats to schools, but he's also studied the best practices for first responders. And we're very fortunate in the city because I would dare tell you, in most jurisdictions, you don't have a hybrid approach. You have police doing one thing and sometimes fire doing another. But here in the city, we have a hybrid command staff where I have fire commander on my, uh, which is immeasurable. It's, it's, it's actually very awesome. And you'll see and hear from Tom here soon. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention that Peter might have missed, but I think I'm very proud of, and Tom took in the lead with Joe Carter in this, is that we also train not only the teachers with the Alice program, but we teach, or, we teach and train the school bus drivers who are key to getting our kids to and from school, but they are key in any community incident. Anytime I have an is issue, I feel I can, and I know I, I, and I have, pick up the phone and call Nancy Hendrickson and say, I need, and she is on it. And I can tell you, these people that drive your buses, that's probably one of the hardest licenses I've ever tried to do, is get a CDL for school buses. Um, they are ready and willing to work, particularly in an emergency, drop of a dime. Because most of them are working not only in your school buses, but in the cafeteria and in the schools. They've got multiple hats. And they're, and they're most willing to work. Uh, but I'll let Tom speak to that school bus training. Um, the other thing is I think what we've learned through the years, um, and particularly in Falls Church, is we have evolved in, um, out of some really bad incidents. Uh, December 14, 2012, I was on the phone with Tony, um, and, and that was, um, excuse me, Sandy Hook, one of the worst days. And me and Wyatt were standing side by side looking at what was going on there. Uh, but we got on the phone with the schools very immediately. And what you need to realize with that, what came out of that in terms of action, is then you got Securitas. That's when you got cameras in the schools where our dispatchers can see immediately what's going on. Why does that matter? That matters because a dispatcher sitting in a booth talking to a police officer can explain exactly what's going on in the hallways. And we only do that when we have to. We drill on it, but when there's a need for immediate response and getting right to the threat, there's nothing better than having eyes on what's going on. And that came out of Sandy Hook. Sandy, uh, Securitas came out of Sandy Hook. And the other thing that we do along the lines of that is we test. We test our dispatchers to ensure that they can get into the system and look at things in an emergency. We also test the Securitas system. We have a mom, or a pretend mom, try to get into the schools at different times to see if the system's working. And the schools have done a very good job. Um, the last thing I, I just want to talk about, the day-to-day the -day incidents in the schools. You know, uh, we, we do, we, we are so very fortunate that we do have a good relationship and we talk often. If we do have a, uh, a problem, we're often you know, sometimes grinding it out, trying to learn what's in the best practices, not only for the police, but for the schools. And sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes we have hard discussions, in, in large part because they're children. And most of the people that work under me or with me are parents first, and they understand that. Um, and then when we have incidents that are born out of criminal investigations and we have to take cr criminal um, criminal investigations into the school, um, they're, they're very difficult too. I mean, last year, between November and February, those 11 months, we had four very serious school threats. And of those school threats, those, those investigations, we dropped everything. We dropped all other investigations, all the investigators and patrol, for the most part, are looking at that threat and how can we mitigate it, how can we stop anything from happening. And they're, they're sensitive, because you got kids, you got families, and you got victims, and victim families. And it's very, very hard to communicate, sometimes all of it immediately. 
because there are some sensitivities and confidentialities in and around that. Um, but we try and do better each time when that comes along. Um, and unfortunately, with each one, we get a little better. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, a lot of the things that we do in the schools, we can't necessarily tell you in terms of security. So a lot of it's confidential. It would be foolish for me to sit here and explain everything that we did. Um, but I can tell you we do have the best interest of children in this learning environment um, on the top priority. And I recognize oftentimes, um, you know, this comes with, you know, some scared. But I tell you, most of the, the interactions that we have with kids are really very positive ones. And it and it's really starts with the kids, really is. So thank you for your time. And I'll give this back to Doc. All right. Thank you, Chief. All right, I'm going to ask our um, panel participants to come up, um, and as they do, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce them, and I'll start with Rebecca Sharp. Um, Rebecca is our Director of Student Services uh, in the City of Falls Church School. Um, Bill Bradley, Bill is the, uh, one of the architects with Stantec. Um, welcome, and Stantec, if you don't know, is the company that is building or designing um, our new high school. I'd like to welcome Eric Boson, who's one of our students at George Mason High School. Uh, for being here today. Kristen Michael, our Chief Operating Officer, is here as well from um, the school system. Uh, Matt Hills, our Principal, uh, Mr. Hills, and Tom Polera, uh, who's been mentioned repeatedly, I think, at this point, <laughs> um, to, to join us here. Um, I, I, I took the liberty of putting some questions together, um, and I'm, I'm going to, um, my hope is that as they're a answering these questions, that they may actually end up in a conversation with each other, um, or I may follow up with a, a question or a comment. Um, and so I, I sent these um, to them the other day just to kind of look at so they could start thinking about them. And they were in an order, and I'm not going to go in the order that they were in. So I'm sorry. I guess I should have told you that in advance. Um, but I do, I do want to. Um, I want to start with Bill Bradley, actually, from Stantec. Um, Bill, part of the reason that Stantec won this award was uh, when they were doing the, their um, presentation, they did talk quite a bit about safety and security. So I have my question here, and I'm just going to ask, uh, ask it of you, and that is if you would share with us your thoughts about how a building and design supports the creation of a climate of caring that's both operational as well as physically um, able to, to handle the stressors of safety and security. And then do you have any examples of other buildings that you've designed and how have they created that space of care with respect to safety and security? Okay. Is it, live? it is live, but they're not going to be able to hear you because it's actually live to that. So I'll tell you what, why don't... Can you hear me in the audience? I'll just, I'll just go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you, and that's a long question, so if I don't get to everything, remind me of the, the part at the end about other schools that I may have designed. Um, but, but thank you to you, uh, to you, Chief, to the League of Women Voters for, for having us here to talk about this today. And as I sat and listened to you present again, I was reminded of the, the links that, that everyone goes to operationally to um, provide safe environments for our, our teachers and students, and that's it's really moving, and I'm grateful for that because I'll confess that as an architect, there's only so much that I can do to protect. Um, frankly, um, I can delay and discourage, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to qualify my remarks by saying that the first and foremost, and Chief, you mentioned this, um, I'm a parent. Um, I'm a parent of two high school students. I have a freshman and I have a senior. And over the course of my career, as I've designed schools, they've been growing up. And it's through their collective eyes that I filter every decision I make, whether it's about how they will learn or how they interact with their peers or the environments that their teachers will teach in or how they're made safe and secure. So for me, this is um, it's not academic or theoretical. It's very personal. So in thinking about that, um, We've talked a little bit today about, I think, or we've referenced the, the worst case scenario. But when I think about the, 
the kinds of things that my, my children face and their teachers face and their friends face every day, the spectrum is much broader. And it's the kinds of threats that you referenced earlier. It's everything from bullying, including cyberbullying, but also gangs. Um, it's people who, who enter the building intend to do harm with weapons other than guns, um, which is more likely. And it's also um, teen suicide. And so these kinds of things that, Eric, I, I imagine that you'll talk about in just a moment are the things that I think about. And so in designing a school, I'm trying to design along a spectrum and balance. You know, on the one hand, the only way you can protect perhaps from an active shooter is to, to design a fortress. That's not the kind of environment that we want for our children necessarily. It doesn't foster the culture of caring that you referenced earlier. And so in thinking about this, I want to give you two names to look up when you go home. The first is, is Dr. Dewey Cornell. Um, Dr. Cornell is a psychologist. He's a distinguished professor at Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia. He's renowned in his field for um, studying and, and meeting with students who have in the past had intent to do harm. And I know you're very familiar with the DC sniper. He is interviewed him along with many others. The other one is Michael Dorn. Michael Dorn is a former police officer, um, now a forensic specialist who is on scene at many of these, these events. The message that both of them, if you look them up, Michael Dorn and Dewey Cornell, suggest is that the biggest thing that we can do to prevent an incident is create a culture of care. And I heard Michael Dorn speak on that three weeks ago at a school security summit in Chicago. And so he was speaking to architects and he challenged us to think about how we as architects create a community of caring. And I'll share with you a little bit about what we've done at the new high school to do that. And part of it has to do with creating connections. And the high school, as Dr. Noonan alluded, is a actually at some points it's seven stories. And so it, it has a potential. Do you want me to start over? <laughs> <laughs> I was teaching. Um, it has the potential to be very compartmentalized in the way that George Mason High School right now is very compartmentalized with its wings and hallways. And so to um, guard against that, there's a great deal of openness and transparency within the school. And not just between the classrooms and the hallways, the way that Dr. Newton showed, but also between floors. And so that between the third and the fourth floor, for instance, there's a performance learning stair that creates an open area where students can see and be seen. Um, between the third and fourth floor, there's also an opening in the floor um, in a different part of the building where, again, students can see and be seen. And going to the second part of your question, places that we've designed schools where this community of cult or this culture of caring has been promoted, it's places where the teachers and the students are part of a larger whole. It's not one teacher who is cloistered in his or her classroom with a group of 24 students, but along with you know, sort of taking cues from the middle school model of instruction, the whole of the teachers are responsible for the whole of the student body. And Dr. Newton, you talked about having 2,600 students in the school district, that every student is, is knowable. And that's the idea with the design, is to make sure that every student is knowable, invisible, and passively supervised, and that each student understands that he or she is cared for. I can go into specifics about the design later, but that's probably enough for now. Thank you. I, I'm going to actually um, let Eric go next, because Eric, I, I'm, thank you again for, for coming and being part of this today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience at George Mason High School? And what have you seen and heard with respect to school safety? Do you feel safe at school? Um, and what makes you feel safe or not safe? And what kind of worries you? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a senior at George Mason High School this year. Uh, I, uh, I definitely feel safe in a general sense at, uh, at George Mason. Uh, as Chief Gavin says, uh, uh, you know, safety, school safety starts at home. And it, uh, it, we also have a culture of caring, uh, as Principal Hills has worked to promote. Uh, and I definitely feel safe in that respect. You know, safety is more than how well you can barricade a door. Uh, and I think that our school has historically done pretty well at that. Uh, there are definitely some 
specific concerns that I've heard voiced by other members of the student body, but in general, uh, I feel like we have a pretty safe environment, and we're definitely working, as, as you can obviously see from uh, the prior speakers, uh, to, to improve that as best we can. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hills, let's, let's go to you. Um, as, the, as the school leader at George Mason High School, what steps do you take to support and the overall wellness and safety, both physical and emotional, um, with your students that you serve? And then here's a the, here's the scenario for you. Um, a student hears from another student that their friend is contemplating something serious. We don't know exactly what that would, would be. Um, but with your experience, um, what would happen if, if that were the case? And how have students reacted? And if you could also um, talk a little bit about the relationships that um, your staff has with students, that would be great too. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think to, to Eric's point, we had an opportunity to sit down last week and kind of go over um, the first question, do we feel safe? And we were absolutely in agreement. You know, as, as the principal, it's, it's, that's my number one priority, uh, and it's paramount. And I think it does go beyond the physical safety, which I'm so glad Dr. Noonan had an opportunity to talk about all the reasons why we do feel safe physically. But, you know, when you think about the emotional wellness of our students, that is the top priority for us. And we were reflecting on some of the things that we've integrated into our schools over the last couple of years in terms of making sure that students' social emotional wellness is taken care of uh, from different programs that we've had. Uh, recently, as of Wednesday, this past Wednesday, we have our advisory periods where teachers were talking to students about their emotional wellness. Uh, being in a desired state versus being in uh, an undesirable state and what are some of the stressors we face as students and a community uh, and that went all the way from teachers to students and we were able to really have those difficult conversations and I think that goes to Dr. Noonan's point about building relationships in the building you know I can tell you about when I first started in education years ago uh, much of what we saw in the classroom was teachers teaching content all right in order to make sure that we develop a culture of caring, we now need to shift towards, it's not just about the content, which, mind you, is very important. It's about how do we build these strong and positive relationships with students, from the administration, to teachers, to custodians, to our counselors. Uh, it's not just a counselor's job to be able to know if a student is in a particular state. And that's something we take very seriously. Uh, and I think it's something that, that we, uh, make sure that we focus on in all of our classes and that really does have a trickle-down effect and when you talk about a particular experience what I can share with you is um, we make sure that students they hold one another accountable uh, as we mentioned it can't just be you know the administration uh, finding out a particular issue with a student it has to be other students feeling comfortable and confident that they can come to a counselor that they can come to an administrator that they can go to a teacher and share information and that is what has happened in the past I can tell you immediately when we have had an issue and I know Chief Gavin mentioned four as of last year I cannot begin to tell you how quickly uh, we were notified of this because we have students who care about one another all right, and we're able to make sure that those students feel supported. And so when you think about the culture of caring, it does. It starts with the administration, uh, kind of has a trickle down effect with the counselors and the teachers, but the students work together. And I've never been in an environment where uh, students are really able to hold one another accountable, but care about each other in a manner that allows us to facilitate safety. So I think that's where it comes from. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you to pass that mic down to Rebecca Sharp. Uh, Rebecca is our Director of Student Services in the City of Falls Church Schools. And um, I think what Mr. Hills and what Eric and, and what Bill, well, more Eric and, and Mr. Hills have done is sort of just outline sort of the, the importance of um, the emotional safety and the emotional wellness of students versus the hardening of school. So I see it in sort of two, si two sides of the house, if you will. So can you talk a little bit about what student services is and then what in that world supports um, school safety and security? And what, what do you see happening with that? All right. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. Um, school safety, you know, we're all here because it's of the utmost importance and learning can't occur without it. And as um, Dr. Noonan said, the folks that work in my department, which are is student services, those are our folks who are our social workers, our school counselors, our um, public health nurse, our school psychologists, our behavior specialists. 
and all of those folks are in our schools every single day. They are our first responders. They're the folks who sit on our crisis teams. And on the slides, one of the things that they talked about was the threat assessment team. The school psychologists, the social workers, the counselors work with the administrators to make sure that the structures and supports are in place. That's what occurs within my department. We kind of, we focus on really the social and emotional well-being and we come at it from a multi-pronged approach. We really look at things in terms of education and prevention. And when I talk about education, it's how are we training our teachers and our bus drivers and our paraprofessionals and our folks in the cafeteria who are there on the front lines with our kids every single day to recognize stressors in students, to recognize any triggers, to, to help build those relationships and to help foster those connections. And they're the folks that when they see that student that's isolated, they're the folks that can work with the kids and help reach out to that isolated student to bring them in and get them the supports that they need. Another piece that um, my staff works diligently on really is prevention. And that means that we've got supports in place for students when we recognize that they are struggling um, with their emotions or that there are stressors going on in their family that are impacting how they're feeling when they're coming to school. And we do a lot of work um, in the area of prevention. All of our counselors and our social workers and our school psychologists in every single building in this division conduct small group sessions with kids. They also offer one-on-one -on -one counseling for kids. And that has, is such a valuable resource so that when we recognize that student really is struggling or that family needs some additional support, that we have that person who is right there attached to them managing that case. Another piece that we um, really work hard with in terms of prevention and education really is the training that we're providing to our staff. And um, in fact, we just got finished doing some supervision training with staff to make sure that you know not only are we um, aware of what's going on physically but we're aware of what's going on emotionally and what's going on with technology what is it that's going on you know when kids are using technology and are we as adults aware of of what what's going on and that we've got good relationships with our students another um, piece that we've really um, started to explore and we're working towards um, bringing to the division is mental health first aid I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with the Red Cross and the standard first aid training that comes from a um, really a practice of first aid for physical safety we're looking at modules for a standard of practice for modules for mental health first aid so that when we do recognize you know that students are struggling that we have good skills that we feel like as teachers and as paraprofessionals and as administrators and folks that work in schools that we have the skills and the knowledge to when a student is dealing with a lot of anxiety or depression that we have a, a good foundation for how can we start helping that student um, another piece that I wanted to talk about is trauma-informed care. We have, you know, a lot of students who are coming to us now who've experienced a lot of trauma. And how does that impact their interactions within the classroom, within the hallways, and with each other as students, and how they interact with adults? And so we're really working hard to build up that trauma-informed piece as well so that we as adults know the right ways to respond to, to students who have been impacted by trauma. And the last thing I want to leave you with, the most important thing that the folks in my department really do is to build relationships and help to facilitate connections so that when we recognize a family you know needs help that we help connect them to resources whether it be mental health resources whether it be that the family's in crisis because you know they need you know some financial assistance it may be that they need you know just access to counseling services and supports and those are things that our staff does every single day because we are in our department, we really are focused on the social and emotional well-being and the mental health care. And our folks are there 
also after a crisis happens to really focus on the stabilization and that aftercare plan and making sure that that both the whether I don't like to use the word perpetrator, but that is a word. The perpetrator in a school safety incident has the supports that they need and the victims have the supports that they need. And so those are the roles that the social workers, the counselors, and our school psychologists take on in, when you're talking about school safety. So I'll be here to answer any other questions. If I can, I, I wanted to add one thing for um, you talked about the role of the, of the student social services and the counselors, and the whole student services suite has been located. The decision that was made early on was to locate them on the third floor along with the students so that they're right there, have immediate access, and can, can do that kinds of um, four forensics that you're talking about to identify potential stressors and, and trauma. So that's one thing that we're doing. That's a really um, key point. You know, that when I was showing that first floor entry, you know, we've got the cafeteria and the auditorium there, but um, the main office on that first floor will have Mr. Hill's um, a front office staff, but as, as Bill indicated, all of the other administrators, all of the school support will be part of a support suite on that third floor where all of the academic, core academic courses are beginning. So thanks for sharing that. Kristen Michael is our chief operating officer. and. Kristen, um, as a chief operating officer, first of all, what are the swath of responsibilities that you have in that role? And then what do you um, see uh, happening with respect to those um, roles that go to the hardening of, of, school, uh, of our schools? So thank you so much for the question. I am responsible for facilities, food service, technology, daycare, human resources, finance and transportation. So kind of a broad swath of activities. And, and I'll talk about the hardening, but first I also wanna talk about all of the relationship building and all of our support departments this year. Relationships have really been a key focus and something we've really looked at. We're the department that starts off with the first touch of our students in the morning and the last touch at the end of the day, right? We see kids when they're getting on the bus, right? We see kids throughout the day Right, whether we're interacting with them as we're cleaning or working in the facilities, serving them lunch, and then as we serve them in our daycare program after school and transport them home. Right, so relationships have really been key, and that has really happened with the support of everybody here at this table. Right, student services and Rebecca's team has done a fabulous job training all of us in terms of supervision of students, really looking at relationships, things that we've been working on building with all of our staff, and Tom has been absolutely outstanding in terms of providing us with training in terms of responding in an emergency. And transportation did receive all of that training over the summer, it's really the initial kickoff. Um, so they've been really integral at helping all of us serve students together. So when we look at the hardening of the building, there's the obvious hardening of the building when we look at things like all of our exterior doors, ensuring that they're locked, that they can't be pulled open, that we're actively monitoring them with cameras, but it also goes to helping all of our support staff really be aware of what's going on in terms of our doors. When you think about gaining access to school facilities, right, support departments are often the ones that have those exterior doors, whether they're the custodians going in or out, the Securitas staff that facilities in Seve Padilla oversees, right, or food services who's getting deliveries through the loading dock. Right, so really thinking about how are we monitoring those exterior doors and ensuring they're hardened. But that hardening also goes further when we start to think about things like information technology, right? How do we ensure that our students are safe and protected on the internet? What things can we put into place to try to protect them and prevent some of bullying, harassment, and those other components? So it really is that collaboration as we think about how are we serving students. And then also our daycare pro program also provides great opportunities for students to engage in positive activities, both after school and during breaks. So whether you look at the summer or school holidays, um, that program really does engage students all the way through the middle school level, um, which is again a positive activity that supports staff facilitate. Thank you. And um, last but certainly not least uh, on our panel as we kind of move into the hardening of schools is Tom Palera, who serves as the fire marshal and also is responsible for emergency management here in the city of Falls Church. And so, um, Tom, you know, one of the things you've heard, we, we've heard now 
um, a number of times is Alice. Um, and what is Alice and Stop the Bleed is another um, active solution. Um, and those are two areas that our schools are actively engaged in working through to support the overall safety uh, and security of the building. Can you just, can you describe these? Um, sure, I'm not sure if you wanted to show this video. Do you want me to show video. the video? Yes. yes. You want to please. set it up? Sure. Uh, so this video here uh, is called the first 12 minutes. It's what we've put together, which it combines the Alice principles along with Stop the Bleed. We've been teaching this program to houses of worship, our private school, all city employees, and now our school system. So we're really proud of, of, of what we've, we've put together here. Um, based upon what all these great folks have talked about, you could see how multifaceted safety is when it comes to schools. So this is the part that we really don't want to talk about too much, the active shooter part, but we need to. In today's world, we're met with the reality of active violent incidents almost every day. And every community is plagued with the thought that it could happen in the schools, in our churches, in our malls. Falls Church Police, the Fire Marshal's Office, and Office of Emergency Management have embarked on a new program called the First 12 Minutes. We're moving from what was a passive response approach to active shooter events to a proactive response approach. We were trying to develop a program that would encompass both first aid, which is the tactical emergency casualty care, otherwise known as Stop the Bleed, into a program that worked for barricading, locking down, and confronting a shooter. We decided to go through the ALICE program and what we've done is we've taken facets of the ALICE program into the first 12 minutes. So ALICE, it starts with the alert, getting good information. ALICE stands for alert, lockdown, inform, confront, and evacuate. The first 12 minutes is broken up into four sections. The first section is about history and research of active violence incidents all around the world. And in that section, they described the speed of violence, the number of incidents that have occurred in and around this area and around the United States. When you look at active shooter events, many of these events have high casualty counts. And it's due to the way we respond and we create a target-rich environment by putting people in a corner waiting for the police to, to arrive. And that's not the way to do it. So this program, people are spread out, people distract the shooter, and people will confront the shooter. The first tactic taught is the barricade for survival. It's really imperative that we understand that we can and will survive these incidents if we take action. They're common sense type actions. The first thing you want to do is avoid the threat. And secondly, if you cannot avoid the threat, you need to barricade yourself for survival. You barricade yourself with the thought of what's my next step and that next step might be evacuating, that next step might be having to confront a shooter. We teach the participants how to swarm and defend because studies will show if they're distracted, if they're assaulted, they have a less likelihood to kill people if you can swarm and stop the threat and detain the subject then you have the best chances for survival. As a law enforcement trainer in the first 12 minutes class, my responsibility is to educate the participants on the weapons that are normally used in an active violent situation. During that time, I also talk about the ballistics of these weapons. This is important because when we talk about things like cover, concealment, and staying out of the fatal funnel, which are usually law enforcement terms, it helps the students have a better understanding of what we're talking about if they're ever involved in an active shooter situation. Another vital educational component to this class is educating the participants on law enforcement and fire response. By doing this, they'll have a better understanding of what the initial and secondary responsibilities will be of all first responder personnel on the scene. The last step in this program is the tactical emergency casualty care. When people are shot, they start to bleed. And if we can stop the bleed, the chances of survival are great. What is it that you can use in the midst of your everyday things that you carry or what's maybe in a classroom to help you survive and or to help somebody survive that has been shot. These are the types of things that we're trying to teach in the program where we change the way of how that response was before to a new response. 
and one where the individuals on the inside are empowered. And being empowered makes all the difference in the world. You do have a chance and you do have the right to go home to your families and that's what this program is all about. We're looking forward to fortifying the community, ensuring resilience, and making sure people know they can survive in the worst case scenario of an active violence incident. So Tom, talk, talk a little bit more about it and also if you could um, clarify that that um, swarming technique isn't the first technique or, or the preferred technique. No, the, the preferred technique is not to be there, is to evacuate and to get out of the building. So for quite some time now, my, my job has been pretty much studying active shooter events, specifically in schools. Not so much from the perspective of law enforcement and fire, but from the perspective of those in harm's way. What can we learn from Columbine that we haven't already learned? What can we learn from Virginia Tech that we haven't already learned? So when you start looking at these, you, you start to see that those that are in harm's way, they're the first responders. And how do they respond? Uh, up until this past year, most classrooms, if they were told to lock down, they didn't know why they were locking down. Were they locking down for a tornado, for a police action up at the intersection, or for a shooter behind their door? They didn't know why. So the alert piece becomes critical. Why, what are we doing? And what is, are we locking down? It needs to be good information, right information to right people at the right time. So we should know whether or not there's someone in the building with a weapon and where are they located? Because what we want is we want people to evacuate the building. So if I know something's happening on the other side of the school, get out of the school. But if I'm nearby, I might have to take that approach where I need to barricade. If I can't bar and if I'm in that room where the shooter's coming in, now we need to deal with how do we confront the shooter. So the process that we're teaching right now is the ALICE program. Um, we, we've come a long way, <laughs> uh, to say the least. Uh, and, and I guess every time we teach this class, there's the aha moment because we go through scenarios uh, in which we actually line everyone up in a corner, how we would do a traditional lockdown. What do we do? We put everybody in the corner, we, we turn off the lights, we cover the glass, and we hide. And can a shooter still get in? If the shooter gets in, typically we cr just created a target-rich environment. When we looked at the statistics, a dynamic police shooting is somewhere between uh, the, the percentage of hitting the target is somewhere between, for a police officer, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. In an active shooter scenario, that's between 50 and 70 percent. So when you say why, you have to look at how are we responding. And if we're putting everyone in the corner, we've just created a target-rich environment. The next step is understanding the speed of violence. So for, for quite a while, and even today, it's still happening where Law enforcement and fire are trying to figure out ways we can respond faster. How do we get into the school faster? How do we get paramedics in? You'll hear the term uh, rescue task force. We want to we want to get firefighters and EMS folks with ballistic vests, and we want to get them in there with our police officers. But if you think about it, most active shooter scenarios, it's over between six and ten minutes in. Law enforcement may get on the scene and a good response time is 12 minutes. So they're already at the recovery phase of the operation. They're not at the rescue phase, they're at the recovery phase. So who in the classroom can be the first responder? And that's why this program is so critical. We're now teaching the teachers how to respond. It's not a topic that we really wanna discuss and every time we go through this program, when we start the conversation, it's extremely difficult. By the time we're done with our practicals, for the most part, everyone feels so different. They feel empowered, they feel like they can control the situation, and they feel like they, they, ha they have a right to live, they have a right to continue on. And we're showing them techniques that, in which they could do that. So that's mainly the ALICE program. Uh, the Stop the Bleed program, if you think about how we respond as a society to certain events. 
if you look back at the Las Vegas Route 91 festival, who transported most of the folks to hospitals? It was citizens. Citizens were transporting in the back of pickup trucks. So when we think about the speed of violence, how long it's going to take for folks to get on the scene to help, we have to have certain things in our classrooms, in our school. A tourniquet. A tourniquet applied can save a life. Understanding how to do stop the bleed becomes critical. So the, the program that we're doing right now with our school system, there, we've got about half the teachers through the program. Uh, it, we've got, we're, we're working tomorrow with about another 80 or so. Um, but then we, we're going to have to exercise it, and we're going to have to improve upon it. But I will tell you, we are leaps and bounds beyond where we were. And, and we're so far ahead of other areas that, that are not doing this. Um, there's another program called, uh, what, what's the program used in some of these other jurisdictions? Uh, it's uh, Until Help Arrives. And Until Help, Help Arrives is a great program, but it's mainly focusing on the first aid piece of it. But it's not focusing on, what if that shooter's coming through your door? How do I respond? What if the shooter is down the hall? How do I barricade? So these are all critical pieces of the response element and how we deal with school safety. The preparedness piece has been long ignored nationally as far as teaching our teachers, and it's, it's now time that, that we teach everybody. Great, thank you. Um, what has happened was what I was afraid was gonna happen, <laughs> and that is that we were gonna take uh, most of the time, but um, before we um, go any further, I do wanna um, have an opportunity, first of all, thank you for your, your very thoughtful and comprehensive responses. Um, but I would like to invite the community, if you have questions for myself or for the panel that we may be able to answer, we certainly would, would welcome those and, and would love to hear. Yes. Um, just a, um, we're gonna bring the microphone around. <coughs> uh, just, just a couple of points. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, the uh, mental health train, you know, first aid or Red Cross training is just you know, it's, it's fantastic. Um, the, with respect to the glass messaging in the new school, thank you for doing that. In my head, um, somehow there were Florida glass windows on both sides with sunlight coming in both sides. I don't know how that was gonna work, but. Uh, <laughs> does, that does kind of keep, you know, keep coming back. So I think you're gonna need to continue to reinforce that. Um, I guess the last thing, um, I wish there were some teachers here today one of them is on a plane so she can't be here um but i you know i i'm struck by that and the teachers being the first responders and going through this alice training now um i just i guess i wish they were i don't know if they were invited or couldn't make it or what you know it's not their work day i wish they were here um and, and i guess my one question would be do the teachers now have all the equipment and everything that was mentioned in the alice training you know the tourniquet or door stuff to keep the door you know the doors that open in you know, all that kind of stuff. What's the, and what's the plan for getting it for them? This is a process right now. So we're showing them techniques. Uh, and they, the techniques are as far such as you saw people throwing something at, a, at someone entering the door before they swarm. Uh, you know, our, our thought process there is anything you have, what do you have that's readily available? You have books, you have staplers. You're throwing these things to distract a shooter and you're going towards the shooter to swarm. Some of these other things that you're talking about as far as uh, the doors, uh, we show them different techniques. Uh, but again, this is a process. And uh, you know, we've been communicating back, back and forth as far as where we have certain needs. OK, that, that's great. I think stuff like the first aid equipment, you know, the tourniquet it's, or the gauze to jam. The, you know the I mean? intent with these is to wherever you have an AED. My, my goal is wherever there's an AED in the city anywhere, it has a stop the bleed kit with it. Okay, um, I, my, I guess my last piece would be, this is a really emotional thing. So I think we've done a really good job with the social aspects of you know the school prevention. And I think that's great. I think we need to continue that conversation about the you know, extremely, extremely unlikely but non-zero chance that something terrible is gonna happen. And so I think we just need to acknowledge how emotionally dicey that is, especially for the first responders who are gonna be the you know, it, it teachers. It definitely is. Um it is emotional, and, and when we started working with the teachers, uh, and I, I went through the training myself, uh, and, and when I went through it, I mean, I was 
it's just a jolt to even to, to look at for the first time. And some of the stories that, that Tom tells about whether it's Columbine or, or the like, um, are, they just sort of bring back um, this sort of historical trauma that I think all of us as a nation went through um, during these really terrible times. And, and um, so, so being cognizant of that is certainly important. And, uh, but we are committed to um, you know, continuing this process and making sure that we continue with the social emotional aspects, but also um, hardening where we can. Hi, yes, my name is Heidi. I have a daughter at Mason. Sorry for my shaky voice, I get nervous. <laughs> and a daughter here at uh, MEH. And my daughter at Mason um, mentioned to me that she understands that now she's not supposed to, or possibly a change in uh, training, that they're not supposed to shelter in place, that they're supposed to evacuate. So I guess my, my question is, you know, at this point in time, what, what is the student's understanding um, based on a certain situation of what they're supposed to do. That's great. So, um, and thank you for, for asking your question. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we sit down with all grade levels and we go over our lockdown procedures that are in place. Uh, there are a few distinctions between, let's say, a, a tornado or a hurricane uh, as opposed to, you know, another emergency. Uh, currently in place right now, we do have uh, several lockdown procedures that do not incorporate evacuating the building. So I'm a little bit curious to see where she's getting some of this information. But as you can, you know, probably uh, ascertain when we're talking about transitioning into a new program and we've been meeting with with some of our student leaders to talk about the Alice program uh, some of those questions may have come up and you know that's that's something that we're going to be meeting I know Eric and I just sat down a little while ago to talk about some of the things we need to do to continue to communicate with our students uh, so they understand that what we have in place is what we have in place and that you know as Mr. Palermo said look there, there is going to be a transition period. We're going to move to Alice, but it is a process, uh, and we're not there yet. Thank you all for very informative um, and obviously very caring uh, presentation. My question is a little bit beyond the mechanics of what we've discussed today. What can we do as a community and as a school district to lobby for changing the laws and the policies in our state and in our country to provide more mental, mental health support and more gun control. Um, and I think that this is something that a lot of people in our community um, are passionate about and agree about. And I, so I'm curious to you know what we can do together to help reduce the need for these types of trainings and possibilities? That's a really great question, and thanks for asking it. Um, each year, um, and I'll talk more locally than perhaps nationally, but each year um, the school board and the city council both put together legislative programs and legislative packages. And uh, this year, um, as part of the legislative package that's being put together, there is um, some commentary in there about the need for I'm trying to remember exactly what it is, but it's mental health services and school safety, um, some of the hardening pieces. It, I don't know um, policy-wise from, and I think your question is maybe how do, we, how do we begin to affect and impact policy with respect to gun ownership or the like. I don't know that it goes that far, um, but it does speak specifically to how can our legislature, state legislator legislature um, support us in the area of mental health and also with some of the, the ways to harden a little bit more. Um, I, I think remaining active in the community is absolutely um, Im important, um, both with your school board and also with your city council, but, but perhaps even more so um, from the national perspective, maintaining those relationships with our, our local legislators um, in Congress and in Senate um, to to begin to push some of those, because uh, I, I, I worry as well um, about access uh, to, to weapons and the like, and that is also part of our, just by the way, part of our threat assessment process is when we go through it with students and with parents, we ask, do you have access to weapons, and, and if so, how, and, uh, and then get with the parents as well and talk to them about it. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Sean Dakin. I'm 
I have a son and uh, just started at Mason, uh, Joseph, and uh, been uh, part of the community for a while and, and do a lot of work on gun violence prevention and gun control. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you, everybody here doing an awesome, awesome job for everything you can do in the schools, uh, which, as Chief Gavin said, is great, but it's the community as a whole. And so I would, uh, I would say that one thing that we can do as a community is be very clear to parents that the, the number one, uh, the number one uh, way that your child could die is having access to guns in the home, okay? American Academy of Pediatrics just released something about this. My wife is a pediatrician. Uh, she works at Kaiser here in town. And uh, we could do uh, much more as a community about educating all of our parents about how dangerous guns are in the home and how important it is for them to lock those guns up. And, uh, and that we could be doing, I think, a lot more proactively. Uh, we're doing a lot of reactive stuff. We're talking about what could happen in the event of an active shooter. Uh, but the reality is, is that any kid that gets their gun, 99% uh, of the time, they're going to get their gun from their parents, right? And so it's the parents that have the responsibility for locking up their guns. And I think we as a community have a responsibility for educating parents. We can't require them, we can't mandate them, but we can make it very clear that they need to lock up their guns, okay? And I know that, uh, Chief Gavin, uh, you have a, a, a gun lock program, right? So you can get your gun locks for free. But I would like to see a lot more proactive communication from the school system and the city about this particular issue. Thanks. Yes, please. There's a actual framework plan that the IACP, which is the International Association of Chiefs of Police, has for gun violence prevention in a community, and it's scalable. Um, I just I think it's the Joyce Foundation that um, actually funded this. And I've taken it for Falls Church and take those measures and, and I guess apply them to the city. And a lot of it has to do with what, you, what is your gun, uh, how many guns do we have in the city and how many gun incidents do we have in the city. And it doesn't matter if it's a, um, if it's a gun being turned in or if it's a gun actually being shot or it's a suicide. Um, we measure all gun incidents. The additional, additional thing what it talks about is um, community partnerships. When the gun dude was in the city of Falls Church, is probably one of my, my best in, uh, informational community partners that I had because he was all about responsibility and assisting me in getting the information that I needed, what was going on in one of his shop and or just in the community in general about gun safety. And a matter of fact, I think a lot of the moms that demand action, I told them, go to the gun dude, talk to the gun dude, sit down with him, um, and understand the process that he has to go through. But I will share with you the um, scalable version of the Falls Church Gun Violence Prevention Plan, and I welcome your input. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Laura, before you go, I, I want to, um, we have another student here, and I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot, you know, <laughs> fellow, but uh, I did want to ask if you had any comments or questions perhaps that have been raised for you, um, either at school or, or from this presentation. Uh, one question that I had was, will students be given a training that's kind of similar to the one that was shown in the video a few minutes ago, like how to barricade a door or how to um, reduce bleeding from a wound or how to like find a safe evacuation route? It's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, we are trying to sensitively work through what that would look like at the high school and at the middle school. Um, and so at some point in the not too distant future, we'll probably take pieces of it um, and slowly train our, our kids as we drill uh, around some of these things. So it wouldn't be all at once, um, but there may be uh, in one, one uh, drill, for example, might be, okay, Guys, we're gonna um, we're not gonna lock down today. Instead, we're gonna barricade. So sh let's let's practice what it would look like to barricade. Um, and and on that, so thanks for asking that question. Um, Bill, do you wanna? Sure. 
I just wanted to add again, talking a little bit about the design to share with everyone that in talking about the evacuate, the E and the Alice, that as part of the school, there are a number of required by code fire safety exits. But in terms of getting students to those exits without having to flood the hallways, there are doors between the classrooms in the back of the classrooms so that the students can matriculate from one classroom to another, to another, to another before then evacuating into the halls and into the, to the stairwell. So you don't have to, as you might imagine now, pour into, and you, you talked about a funnel, uh, fatal funnel. Uh, the fatal funnel, right? We're trying to reduce the size, the window of opportunity for that fatal funnel. Can I, it'll be quick. Okay. Um, Two, two quick comment and a question. Comment is, I just want to compliment you, uh, Dr. Noonan, and your principals on the communication piece. I think that is very, very important. Um, I will never forget a couple years ago, some uh, daycare employees got into an altercation. This is before your time at TJ. No students were you know, threatened, but they saw the altercation. And so when the students got off the bus, everyone's talking, oh. And by the time we got home, Paul Swanson already had a letter out. So I think that getting out in front of these types of situations, the principals are you, letting the community know, I think is terrific. Um, my question is, in terms of the middle school level, that's when a lot of mental health issues start begin to present kids are going through puberty, that sort of thing. What kind of education goes on at, at the MEH level, level in terms of helping students understand, hey, when your friend is behaving like this, it might be a warning sign, get them some help. So I just didn't know what we do at, at the MEH level to kind of help students see warning signs in their sure. friends. Um, I, I'm gonna ask Rebecca to be on, on call in case she wants to chime in as well. Um, but, I, but I will say, um, the one, one of the areas that I think you heard us touch on a number of times is the idea of relationship building um, and making sure that we know each of our students. Um, but also as part of that, being accessible when there is an incident and letting kids know, and this is part of the training we do with students, is if there is something that you need to talk to us about, um, you can ask for a flash pass, for example, to go see a school counselor or see a school psychologist. Um, you can always, in a critical moment, if you need some support, get that extra support. Um, we also tell them to talk to a friend, um, and then we empower those friends to come forward also and share with us if there is something that's going on. Talk directly with a teacher. Um, my, my take on it is sort of it's the Ritz-Carlton model of, of support for kids. So if you say something to a paraprofessional, that may be the first person you say something to, but that person's going to refer the student to someone else, and then that paraprofessional is going to come back around and say, did you get the support you needed? So it's the first and the last person that they hear from. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I think the, the flash passes are really critical. Another piece is that we don't just think about the middle school. Well, I, I think one of the things that's beautiful about um, the division here is even as young as the, our three and four year olds at Jesse Thackeray, they have a program called Super Friends. What does it mean to make me a super friend? What are those characteristics so that I'm there as a good friend to help my classmates? And then when the kids move to, into Mount Daniel, we have all the classrooms are participating in Second Steps, which is a social skills instruction because you teach those skills when kids are young. And then when we move to TJ, we have the Tiger Paws um, program that goes on there where kids are being reinforced for, you know, supporting each other and being kind and demonstrating those characteristics to MEH where, you know, the kids work in, you know, on collaborative, you know, learning activities. If you walk down the hallway, you'll see one of the, the culture building activities that have, that's gone on here at the middle school. And then when you move into the high school, you've got things like every Wednesday morning, mindfulness is offered at the high school. In addition to the work that they're doing with the, that they've just started with the desired state. So across all five of these buildings, you have such caring adults and kids from the time that they walk into our buildings till the time they walk across the stage and ring that bell that's the message that they hear is you know we love each other we care about each other we're here for each other sorry that was frankly, long that, i'm sorry no i'm glad you said all of that because that frankly has been how so so we you heard earlier we had four critical incidences that um you didn't hear a lot about um because 
students came forward and, and a student said something to another student and those students felt strongly enough or comfortable enough to come to the adult. So, um, so thanks for re reinforcing that. One, one other thing I do want to uh, mention is that um, with respect to communication, and it is one of the areas that we're, we're continuing to stay focused on because I appreciate the fact that you got information quickly, um, but if there is a, a crisis circumstance, um, that school messenger uh, is really important for us to be able to get information out quickly through text, through phone, uh, through email. Um, it is how we, we use it for school closures, school delays, or don't use it for school delays, sorry about that, um, <laughs> whatever. Um, but we, we so, so the important thing is that all of the information that we have be as update, updated as possible. Um, so if you can remind your friends and family to always continually update their information, that way we can get information out quickly. I will say that um, this community does an outstanding job of talking with each other when there is an, an incident or an issue that comes up. And so often that, that word of mouth moves much more quickly than we do as a school. Um, but in a, in a crisis communication circumstance, we want to make sure all that information is up to speed. So I, I want to be thoughtful about um, your time and about the time of the panel. So I'd like to thank the panel and if you'll thank them with me at a quick later. We also want to thank uh, Martha and Bill again uh, for pulling all of this together in the League of Women Voters. Um, we'll be here for a little bit longer, so if, if you had a question for us individually that you wanted to ask, we certainly are open to that. Chief Gavin, thank you very much for being part of this, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Bill and Martha if there's any closing remarks that you all want to make. Just thank you all very much for coming and for your um, for your attention, but also for your input, for the comments you made to to uh, the panel and to our speakers. Um, and I uh, I think we've 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 really gathered a lot about the importance of communication to a uh, in this um, in this uh, endeavor. So uh, I hope you'll you'll take it home and share it with your friends and your colleagues. Thanks very much for coming. And I hope to see you again sometime. Thank you.